Uh, we're going to kick things off 10 to 8 on this uh, Friday morning. We are delighted to have you along with us. Keep your comments coming in. Uh, a couple on the uh, chat we were having a bit earlier on on the cycling um, and walking and general uh, commuter on Dublin. So uh, wherever it is you are, keep the comments coming into us. Uh, any sightings of Storm Lorenzo, we'll accept uh, photographs of as well. So do get in touch with us on the hashtag OTBAM. Going to kick things off with the Irish Independent this morning with a photograph last night uh, of uh, celebratory Mo Salah after uh, putting Liverpool 4-3 up in uh, their Champions League clash against Salzburg last night, eventually um, limping over the line, I think it might be said there. That's the report from that game. No stress, Kenny shrugs off Swedish health uh, scare, writes Dan McDonnell here. Ailment uh, was not work-related, insists the Ireland under-21 boss, as medical details to remain private. He wasn't in a giving mood yesterday in terms of what it was that had happened to him in Sweden, but says that everything is all right, says it's congenital, so uh, wants to keep the details to himself. And uh, Rory O'Connor, who's in Japan, uh, writing that Aki back, uh, backing Ireland to step up to the plate after criticism. But it is that difficulty that what is stepping up to the plate in a Russian context today. Mm. If they score 20 tries, people would still go, Asher, sure Russia were shite. Yeah, uh, no, that's it. And uh, <clears throat> I think their, their handling of the ball is going to be interesting. I thought Scotland didn't do a bad job the other day, considering how bad conditions apparently were, where they said it was akin to a soap ball. And Scotland's... Um, you know, it's funny sometimes, you wonder in, in conditions like that, are the forwards or the backs better to handle the ball? Um, because when the forwards get quick ball, kind of, and, you know, they've a totally different agenda to the lads who are out wide. But when the ball is kind of thrown at you at close quarters, it might it might be actually a good bit harder to hold on to it. I would suggest that no, better off none of them hold the ball and better off pump it into the corners. Would yeah. be my view that play the tertiary game with as close as you can and don't be worried about trying to work mm. it up the pitch in 100 phases, that you're better off not doing it if... Like it's inevitable today that there's going to be a lot of handling errors. Yeah. The other thing is, I don't know why they don't wear gloves. Remember mm, Brian O'Driscoll's mm. style? Was it 2007? Yeah. They chopped off uh, fingers, gloves. I don't yeah. know. Like if the ball's going to be wet. Mm, that's a fair point. Too. Any players uh, wear, wearing gloves at the World Cup? Why are the stadiums covered as well? Are they just? They made this decision months ago, and I don't really know. I don't really see the logic of it. Not like in, in sweaty conditions, uh, presuming it's not raining, it doesn't really make much sense to me. But like, it w unless it was made on the basis that obviously we had last week that sort of hurricane situation, the mm. threat of that, and the rains that were coming in, and maybe. If they did make the decision months ago, months ago, it was like, well, listen, if it's raining, we'll just shut them. But I don't also know why they couldn't have made the decision yesterday. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, fair point. I, I, if I were the players, I'm sure I'd prefer to see a bit of sky there, just a bit of air coming in. Um, the sun, summit and nothing, Poch calls clear the air meeting and tells flops to forget freak results. Freak results, I'm not sure about was the freak result aspect of it. I think they were beaten fair and square. Mo and Will for Kill. Um, obviously, a big win for Chelsea, not so much for Liverpool, even well, not so much in the sense that they, they didn't play very well at, at, in stages. And this will not be an Andy 80 minutes, obviously, Andy Farrell, who's he's an interesting character at the moment because he's looking on and I'm sure he's uh, kind of. The narrative of the job he's taken on is changing with every game because, uh, you know, we, we don't, we just the last year hasn't been good really. Um, no. But, you know, he's there in the background, everyone knows he's coming, so um, I wonder, he's probably formulating plans post-Schmidt in terms of changes he'll make. Yeah, hard to know what, what sort of planning you could do at this stage. The Irish Times, I mean, while rugby all the way, and the difficulty here is obviously the game's at a quarter past 11 this morning, so what's going to sell papers uh, from a rugby point of view after That's the that? thing. It's a big challenge it's in the race. And we used to, when I worked the race in post, trying to do massive previews for races that were on at like 12 o'clock. Yeah. It's like, who's going to read this? I presume the vast majority of papers are sold before 11 o'clock, though, are they? I mean, maybe I'm... They probably are, but how much time do you have to read, you know? Um, yeah. And the race supposed to have so much, um, albeit racing people are inclined to get up a lot earlier. Mm. Um, but yeah, it is a challenge. Like I, I, I'm, I was actually just wondering that when you were saying that what sort of coverage will they have today because ultimately how, how much time do you have to read the bloody thing? I feel you've just d delivered a uh, Leo Varadkar style get where, where early in the people morning. get up early in the morning. Yeah. Racing people are more inclined to get up early in the morning. Uh, they, well they are definitely, that's categorically true. Like but you, you're talking about people who are involved in the in racing yards, industry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, not people, like, but people who bet or whatever or racing journalists definitely not. But <laughs> now the average... I remember going to do a stable tour with Kevin Prendergast, who's now, Kevin is 87 this year, I did a stable tour with him a few years ago, and he's like, I'll meet you at half six at the Curra. Mm. It's like, this is a different, it's different ball half game. half six p.m., is it? No, yeah. Uh, Ireland needs statement victory in no win game against Russia, is the uh, point that Jerry Thornley from Kobe writes here. A psychological uh, pick me up, a vital bonus point are there for the taking. There is that thing that we haven't really indulged ourselves in, that if they do go and get the job done, even by 35 points, I mean, I hope this doesn't come back to haunt us, obviously, because mm. I know we had uh, 
Uh, things didn't exactly go away, obviously, in the in the Japan game. Uh, very much not. But uh, you know, there is that positive side to it that we could actually put in a decent performance. Whatever inevitable mistakes are going to be there with the humidity, notwithstanding, we get the result ground out. We get the bonus point in the bag, and there is that element of it that it could actually be quite a positive experience today. But we'll. Uh, and we'll Sexton see. playing as well. I, I thought the Times coverage of the... I read a lot of the Times coverage of the um, Japan game and Gavin Komuski was like... He wasn't holding back. I mean, I saw his player ratings. Like, he really, really castigated an awful lot of the players. And I was... Because it's, it's difficult for a journalist as well when you're probably trying to gain access to players. And it's, it's kind of like... I suppose as a racing journalist from myself, you're always trying to... You're always trying to walk that line where you want access to these people... But at the same time, you have to be somewhat dispassionate and criticise them. And um, I, I have to say, I, I thought, in fairness to him, he, he really didn't hold back, um, which isn't easy in a situation like this. Somebody could, you know, one of these guys say, well, you gave me two out of ten when we played Japan. Like, why would I give you an interview or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, look, like you, you said, gotta, you, have to be, uh, you have to be... Like, it's, the player ratings are a bloody impossible task anyway. Like, the they are. Could, whatever about... Uh, soccer and it's difficult enough when you've 11 players but like trying to cover 15 yeah. in depth and, and sometimes 23 sometimes write a match report as well like, like you know um, Race and Post this is a really interesting story betting giants join forces in 10 billion deal Paddy Power Betfair and Skybet to combine in monster merger and um, would if, if true this would make it I think the biggest uh, it would make it the biggest global betting and gaming operator global online and it would have to cross a few kind of barriers before what happened, but that's huge news. Um, why the Tory will be razor sharp for Enable? Um, Frankie obviously advanced years with Enable bidding to win the arc again on Sunday. And there's an interesting piece as well in the race post about is French racing in decline, which is definitely worth a read. Um, and they actually tip up Manchester United um, to do the job tonight in, in Alkmaar as well. Which why is, is French racing on the, on, on the decline? Um, I haven't read the piece, but I think the point they're making is that it, it, they're not producing top quality horses anymore, whether it's to do with the sires base over there or funding. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot, like, there is a lot of indifference to French racing over there as well. It's only the, like, the arc on Sunday apart. They don't really get crowds, but um, it's probably a cyclical thing more so. Um, yeah. They have a different system over there where if you, if you bet on French racing, you have to bet through the tote. So, right. like, if I lived in France, I'd, I'd have no interest in it. Like, you could never... Betting's a waste of time, really. And um, the day out racing, like, you get some nice tracks, but it's it's fairly soulless, actually. Um, like a lot of American tracks, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. A lot of people just... In Ireland, we're still doing well to get people to go and race, and I think we, we, um, we shouldn't lose sight of that, how important it is. Uh, the Irish Daily Star this morning. Kenny, it's all sorted. Uh, right, it's John Fallon here. That's the that story we were mentioning about uh, that Dan had a bit earlier on. Uh, most, it's on most of the papers this morning. Far more is needed. Michael Scully and the rugby. Darty O'Neill called me a tosser. Uh, was the headline up there? And I think that's a story that's been reported before. But that uh, conversation between Martin O'Neill and uh, Matt Darty previously. And they think they think it's salts over is the uh, tab of the morning here from uh, Scott Coleman. It is now, but only after a big scare for Klopp's men. That's uh, for the reflections. And Liverpool's win last night in Chelsea, uh, beating Lille 2-1. Yeah, um, the mayor, you'll never waltz alone. Salah, Mane and Robbo help Red survive Salzburg scare. Um, Farrell will be fo fully focused now. Obviously, more on Kenny and um, Spurs. Um, Liverpool got out of jail last night, you'd have to say. Um, would have been fairly hairy in terms of their group prospects if they only got a draw. Do you know it's weird? Like they did, and um, but even at three three, like Liverpool are that sort of team that will that switch off. This is what happened. They were three 0 up. They I don't think they switched three off. Goals in, but the, three goals in twenty minutes. Mm, I don't think they switched off. I think they looked vulnerable at three 0 in the first half. They they defensively they didn't look sure at all, particularly Gomez. Um, I didn't think at three all they looked that comfortable. To be honest, I, I really mm. I I wasn't that surprised. That's at a reasonable point. Yeah. Mm. No, they, 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 uh, Salzburg did have chances. They've been playing well, Adrian. Though the last three oh. games against Chelsea, um, Napoli, and they got a one win at Sheffield United, was Sheffield it? Sheffield United. Um, I didn't see that game now. By all accounts, that's three games they haven't played well. I don't think Salah's even playing that well. They still won two of those, right? They won two. Um, they were lucky against Napoli. Chelsea and they were very poor against Napoli. Yeah. Their Champions League form, that wasn't good last night for me. I, I, I think against a better side, they would have been in big trouble. No, like I suppose they, when I say about switching off, obviously Van Dijk having yeah. that slip a player who was, was he player of the year last year? Yeah, like, Not he should have been, but uh, so like you have that and, but it, I mean the bigger point for me was that it did feel that even when they went 3-3 that Liverpool do are that team who have the capacity to go right. We need a Sorry, goal. Sorry, this is 
what's ha just happened here, let's go and get a goal, which mm. is kind of inevitably what happened in the end. But, yeah. Um, it, like, like, they can pull teams asunder with that front three, particularly. They can. Um, the, I think the problem with Liverpool is if if that front three isn't really firing on all cylinders, which I don't think it is necessarily. I don't think Salah's playing that well, despite his two goals. The midfield is basically a functional midfield, and when they break down... like. It was great to see Salzburg, the team from Austria, who obviously wouldn't normally be like a force in the Champions League, come to Anfield and play so well because the Champions League is so heavily, um, you know, dominated by a small number of countries. I, I thought it was a fantastic game of football and their their commitment, an American coach, I think, which is uh, Jesse Marsh. Yeah, very unusual. Um, can't really. I can't think of any U.S. coaches that have made no. an imprint in Europe, um, and I think we still have this kind of almost prejudice against Americans when they talk soccer. It's mm. kind of like, because first of all, you know, there's just something that the game took on so late there. So that's great to see as well. And uh, the, the way they played, I thought they were absolutely fantastic. Liverpool were all over the place at the back. You even remember Adrian nearly getting blocked for a goal um, early in the first, in the second half. And they, they do look without uh, Alisson. They, do, they don't look the same team. They don't look as confident at the back, and um, certainly not last night. And I thought Gomez was very, very poor. Yeah, very poor, yeah. All right, we'll have more reflections on that Liverpool game a little bit later on. Uh, the T London Times investigates Salazar's hold over UK stars is the call here. British coach wants action from Athletics Chiefs, uh, writes Matt Lawton, who's the uh, Chief Sports Correspondent, and uh, Rick Broadband as well. UK Athletics facing calls to launch an inquiry into how much influence the now disgraced Alberto Salazar had over the elite performance programmes for Britain's leading stars. So, uh, as we start to pick away at this story, there's an interesting watch if you want to check it out between Mark Daly, who was behind the story for the BBC uh, with Ger during the week definitely worth checking that out but as we now start to pick away at it and there's more comments about it and it's like fascinating to see that every athlete who is interviewed now posts the post their race at the World Championships is getting asked about it and that's interesting to see their responses in, in several cases um, frequently they've been pretty um, effusive in terms of like you know well we all kind of knew this was going on this is you know a good day that Mm. This guy's been hounded out of the sport, but it's only now that we're starting to look at right, well, who actually who is this guy working with, and mm. like what you know, let's hear from them, um, because obviously there's been some chatter about the fact that he worked with Mo um, uh, Farrow, obviously being one of the uh, one of the things uh, who obviously denies any wrongdoing, but continue to work with Alberto Salazar even after their uh, it had it had emerged that there were questions to be answered some years ago. So, yeah, to see how it unfolds over the next what? Some fairly uh, harrowing suggestions of what he was actually doing with these athletes in terms of like almost experimental stuff. Um, athletes, athletics wouldn't be my thing, but one of the reasons it's not my thing is that I read stories like this and I'm like, why why would I ever watch a race? Because she's always just suspicion there like mm. and um, it's pretty grim yeah well Mark Daly was talking about wh when he was when he was experimenting with the um, medicines that he was in vertical commons working with initially it was on his uh, assistant coach that he was trying all this stuff out like I mean there was I, if I'm that guy I'm like no what like, yeah. Oh gonna, like, but the, at that point, it was it wasn't a conversation. The assistant coach was one of the whistleblowers, if not the whistleblower mm. post that went. This and this is not right. Um, and I think I think that he thought he was working on something that was within the uh, boundaries of legality. Mm. Um, and uh, obviously, at some point, then afterwards, they realised actually this is bending the rules. Mm. Slightly or not so slightly. But uh, but yeah, he had been the guinea pig, which I mean, I, literally uh, a guinea pig. Yeah. Um, let's go again then in the uh, mail um, Farrell, Ireland can prove point against Russia more points away and again Stephen Kenny and obviously uh, Kingston the new Cork boss back in the fold and uh, an interesting press conference down there I think where there were yeah. sort of tough questions of Don Logue in terms of um, you know Tom Humphreys and so on um, so <laughs> Those press conferences are always, I think the, I, I did hear Owen Sheehan asking one of the South African camp about um, doping in rugby earlier in, in the World Cup and um, it's always interesting where they, they don't want to be answering awkward questions at these mm. press conferences and that sort of tension you can hear but the Cork one sounded like it didn't sound like your average uh, press conference to be fair um, I don't know was it was it Shane Stapleton was asking some tough questions yeah. and fair play to Shane because um, I think I think Don Log you know I think he should be definitely asked about that that whole sorry episode yeah, and there's a photograph of Donald Logue that's on the front page of the Examiner this morning as well, uh, as you might expect with his uh, new role there, letting go Donald Logue Cusack on healing old wounds, and uh, plenty more inside uh, inside there as well. You've got one. Yeah, more. Um, the Echo, um, uh, which is a paper that I have to say I've I've rarely seen, but obviously the um, 
Again, it's Cork dominated at the bottom. We're up for the challenge. The new faces of Cork hurling management, Don Logue, uh, Noel Furlong, the under-60 manager, Kieran, Kieran Kingston back in the fold, and Pat Ryan, the under-20 manager, and uh, Niall Scannell, hope, Niall Scannell hoping that Russia game can lift him up the pecking order, um, and David Corkery on page 47. Uh, Dina Asher-Smith is the front page of the Telegraph sports section uh, this morning from the World Championships in Doha with the uh, Union Jack aloft there after winning uh, the uh, 200 metre sprint title um, yesterday. Some lovely footage actually of herself and her mother after that uh, race yesterday with it was uh, pretty emotional stuff. Um, there's one story inside that we wanted to touch on as well. You can see it there um, from the Telegraph Sport Twitter account. It was tweeted out yesterday. BBC in row over Ratcliffe links uh, to Farah and Nike is the story here by Ben Rumsby. Um, short story here, as Ben Rumsby writes, um, the BBC was at the centre of another impartiality controversy last night for failing to inform viewers. I'm sure plenty of people saw this interview. It is widely available on the internet, so go and check it out between Paul Radcliffe um, and uh, Gabby Logan. Um, uh, failing to inform viewers that Paula Radcliffe is married to Sir Mo Farah's coach and sponsored by Nike after she appeared to downplay Alberto Salazar's doping ban. I mean, she didn't appear to downplay it. She just that was clearly what she did. It was uh, almost a sneering sort of... Uh, piece about it, as well as declaring that Farah had made the decision that was right for him, uh, said um, Paula Ratliff here, by remaining in the Nike Oregon project. Uh, when doping accusations against Salazar emerged, Ratliff rejected criticism of other athletes who joined the project. Uh, Ratliff's marriage to Farah's coach Gary Locke and her Nike sponsorship were ignored despite an interview on the BBC website with Steve Cram citing his role as an ambassador for the US firm. Like, it was bizarre. Like, would you not just... It isn't to say that she has to change her opinion, or it isn't to say that... Just put it out there. Just say it. Yeah, like, it's dreadful. Like, you, you, you expect um, very high standards of the BBC, and that's, that's so poor, um, because, you know, people will listen to Paula Radcliffe, and we need to know... If the guy in the in the political debate uh, on on Clare Byrne Live or whatever, if he's a member of Fine Gael, he's it's beholden of him to say, well, I am a member of the Fine Gael party. Like, you just gotta say it. You don't have yeah. to change your views, by you don't Absolutely. have to sort of walk away. Like, and she may be right. She may that may be her opinion. That's mm -hmm. fine. But we need to know that there is a kind of a potential conflict of interest here. It's, it's yeah. It's extremely good context. Mm. I would suggest, but uh, they're under a bit of fire for it. What difference does that makes? Uh, who the hell knows? Um, so that is what's happening across the back pages for this morning.